test. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the church that meets here at Pasir Panjang, or rather Grand Copton Waterfront. Uh, it's really good to see everyone today and uh, to also see smiles. <laughs> yeah, all right. And uh, for those of us who still prefer to wear a mask, no problem. It's totally fine. Yeah, we understand. Yeah, so if you are visiting with us today, welcome once again to all of you. Um, I'd like to start with a little memory that, um, that I had while I was preparing for this message. When I was 21, when I turned 21, um, some of our friends had a surprise party uh, for, for, for me. It was at uh, Uncle Buchai and Auntie Rosie's home. We were having a youth leaders retreat, uh, sorry, not retreat, meeting upstairs. And um, the prayer went on longer than... Uh, than I expected. I was wondering, wow, hmm, okay, today we are very deep into prayer, all right. When I came down the staircase, there was a loud surprise and there were a lot of people uh, down there with food and um, no, no, no gifts, but food and their presence. That's the gift to me, yeah. And I remember that very clearly because, um, well, you know, 21st birthday and all that. Uh, and on top of that, the food was really special, yeah. Uh, my mom, I remember, got for me uh, my favorite beef rendang cooked by her colleague and uh, bagadil. I love uh, Malay food. Yeah, and uh, she also baked her, I think, apple apple pie for me. Yeah, uh, her famous apple pie. The food was really good. Uh, I don't eat so much of that kind of food nowadays because that bought, you know. But well, um, that is something that really stays firmly etched in my memory. The food was good, but the company was even better. And the coming together uh, of my family and my close friends was something that I really treasure. So today, we're going to look at what it means to come together to a table, to come together and eat and feast together as well. But before that, let's uh, rewind a little bit. We've been on a series that traces the pattern of the kingdom throughout the Gospel of Matthew. And two weeks ago, our brother Kyle uh, brought us through how the kingdom is bigger than we may think. It stretched all the way back to the garden where God created the first king and queen, Adam and Eve, to rule over all creation. And it will take its final form in the, at the end of time in the Revelation. Last week, we looked at Matthew 5 and looked at how the kingdom of God is actually an upside-down kingdom. It may not be what we think. It is a kingdom not ruled by class or power or a social hierarchy. It is a kingdom not where uh, might was right as, if, as in the Roman world. It is not a world where winners will laugh at losers. It is a world that will be made right, not through might or power, but through meekness, through mercy, through peace, and through purity of heart. And so today, we're going to move a few chapters down to Matthew 8. In Matthew 8, uh, we will look at how Jesus brings the kingdom of God to an unexpected person, a Roman of all people, their sworn enemies. All right? So before we jump right in, let's take a look at uh, some uh, super macro kind of uh, context so last week we looked at the Sermon on the Mount, right? And uh, before the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we have Matthew 4 verse 25, which says, Great crowds followed Jesus. Who were in the great crowds? Do you all remember? The, the poor, the sick, the lowly, the oppressed, and more. So those were the great crowds who followed Jesus. And after that, in Matthew 5, we are told that the same crowds followed him up the mountain, and he preached what we know as the Sermon on the Mount to them. The Sermon on the Mount then ends, if you take a look at the last verse, with the crowds. After he had taught these things, the crowds marveled you know, at him because he thought, taught sorry, as one with authority. Now, when we start off the next chapter, Matthew 8, verse 1, we are told that once again, the great crowds followed him. So you can see that whole pattern, uh, the symmetry there. And it's all telling us something. It's telling us that this next chapter in Matthew 8 is going to uh, take off right where this stops. Yeah? The same great crowds are going to follow him into Matthew 8 and the story that we're looking at today. 
All right. So in Matthew 8, we have three sets of healings. Okay, three. And the first one, Jesus heals a Jew, a leprous Jew. In the last one, he heals a few Jews. Guess what's going to be in the center? What's going to be the highlight of Matthew 8? Just now I mentioned it, gave the answer away. Uh, it is a Roman centurion and his servant, right? His servant. So as we zoom into this story today, I pray that the Spirit may speak to us as we dig into the story of Matthew 8, 5 to 13. Now, uh, I'd like to invite everyone to open your physical or digital Bibles to Matthew 8, verses 5 to 13. Matthew 8, verses 5 to 13, all right? So um, we're going to take a slow read through all of them, and it's really good if you can have your Bible in front of you so that we can take a look at certain words that mean, um, that have important meaning. Yeah. Okay, let's go on. Matthew 8, verse 5. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. So here we have a Roman centurion. Okay, He's a Roman soldier. He's not just any soldier. He's a centurion. Who are the Romans? They were the colonial masters. And this guy is at the top of their hierarchy here in Capernaum. Capernaum was a Roman garrison town, important one actually. So... Um, this centurion probably had quite a lot of power. Maybe you could say that he was like a, like a small king of sorts, all right? But here comes this guy, and what's he doing? He uh, is asking Jesus to heal his servant. How did he come? He came from what we see, probably alone, or maybe with some others who are not so important. Um, he didn't come, he didn't send his servant to ask Jesus to heal the other servant. He didn't sub it out to someone else. He came on his own, uh, by, by himself rather, and he asks Jesus to heal his servant. This imperial overlord calls Jesus his Lord. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, I will come and heal him. All right, I will come and heal him. Now, if the story ended just here, it will make a pretty good ending, right? And they have lived happily ever after. And the Roman centurion went home happily. Yeah? But there's more to the story that Jesus wants us to know. There's more to the story that Matthew, the author, wants to highlight. That's why he's including it here. Verse 8, the centurion replies, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. This man, a member of the Roman Empire, understood power, right? The Roman army, um, as all armies are, was very, very hierarchical. And the Roman centurion held great power. But that power was only given to him by the emperor, the Caesar or the king, you could call it that. Yeah? And so if his soldier defied him, his soldier was guilty not of defying him as a person, but of defying the emperor. He understood power. And so he knew that Jesus held power that was given to him by a divine God. Yeah? Now this understanding, this comparison there, right, is not perfect, but it was good enough. For Jesus is good enough for him because let's look at what Jesus says in this. He says, uh, He marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. No one in Israel. Okay, now let's let's take a look at your at your Bibles. Who did he say this sentence to? Who did he say it to? The crowds, the crowds who were following him. Who were these crowds who were following him? They were the, the Israelites. And what kind of a profile? Social profile, perhaps. The poor, the lowly, the oppressed, the sick, and so on. These were the people who were following him. Okay, so if you try to imagine it in your mind, uh, like, a, like a movie of sorts, here's Jesus in the middle. Who's following him? Big crowd of people who are the sick, the poor, the lowly, and so on. They are the underclass of Roman Empire. They are the unwanted. They are the castaways. 
here along comes this Roman centurion, the, at the top of the pyramid, you know, and he's coming here and he's asking Jesus for help. And Jesus just told this group that, blessed are you, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. And now he tells this guy here, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. No one. This guy has greater faith than everyone I've met in Israel. That says a lot. Here is a man who, by all accounts, should hold power over Jesus because he's the colonial master, right? But here he is begging for help. Here is a man who, by all accounts, is actually not poor in spirit, not, uh, sorry, not poor, sorry, and not suffering, but he is poor in spirit. He's humble. He's coming before Jesus with submission. And here is a man who did not grow up learning about the coming Messiah, about this figure, Jesus, who would be the one who would write things in uh, a broken Israel. And yet, now he's coming into the kingdom, he's skipping the queue. This is totally, like we said last week, upside down, right? So let's pause and soak in this context here. It's a divine reversal of what everyone would have expected. And Jesus goes on to describe. Let's look at verse 11 here. Verse 11. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom, the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Wow, that's quite a lot. Huh? That's quite heavy stuff, actually. Um, for me, I'm not sure about you. For me, verse 12 really jumps out. Uh, who are these sons of the kingdom? And why are they being thrown out into outer darkness? It's like, you know, going to hell. It literally was. In the Jewish world, this is the description of hell, right? So who are these sons of the kingdom? And why are they being thrown out? We've got to read in context. Jesus is saying that many are going to come in like the centurion who have faith. And these many who come in will get to sit at the table. But the sons of the kingdom, the ones who were born into it, the ones who have the birthright to it, somehow they're going to be thrown out. Why? Well, in context, it's probably because they don't want to come to the table just like these people who are coming from east and west want to. They're hungry for it. So the big question is, what is the table? Where are all these people streaming in towards? What is the table? In the days before Jesus began his ministry, and um, for some people even afterwards as well, the Jews had this expectation of a Messiah who was coming to make all things right. We are familiar with that. But one very uh, important aspect of this Messiah's rule was that when he comes, he's going to have a big banquet. Okay, we call it today the Messianic banquet. He's going to have a big feast. He's going to throw a party and he's going to celebrate. And one text that um, was very important in the minds of the Jews of Jesus' day was Isaiah chapter 25. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 25. You may want to refer to it in your Bibles, or if you like to, I'm going to flash it up here. Because I thought, um, when, when I read this, uh, a lot of the repeated words and images popped out to me. And I'd like to uh, just kind of maybe share it with you. Maybe um, it may be helpful to you if you read through texts like this as well. Yeah? Maybe some of you already see texts this way. So, Isaiah 25, as we read through, I'd like us to pay attention to the repeated words and images that are being used. It's like the image is being painted in your mind, uh, 3D printing virtually. On this mountain, Yahweh of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. 
and the Lord Yahweh will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For Yahweh has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for Him that He might save us. This is Yahweh. We have waited for Him. Let us be glad and rejoice in His salvation. I'm not sure if you guys uh, ever watched the, the film Dune. Yeah? Those who are a bit more uh, into science fiction, you may have watched Dune. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit like Star Wars, but wow, way deeper. And um, they have this figure also. I think it's called a Messiah or something like that. It's actually very, very influenced by, by the Bible. Yeah? And um, they are, it's, it paints a very interesting picture of all the uh, people waiting, standing, camping outside the gate just to get a glimpse of whom they, uh, the equivalent of the Messiah. Yeah? It's science fiction, yeah? but it's very interesting as they paint such a picture. Okay, so what do you see when you read through this passage? Just now, our brother Kyle also read through uh, this passage, and uh, I wonder if you start to see the repetitions. Yeah, In this passage of Scripture, we see how Yahweh is going to lay a feast of rich food and a feast of well-aged wine. Abundance, yeah? It's really gao gao, okay? Very good stuff, the best of the best. Last time my dad liked to say, the best, the boost, the bust. <laughs> I don't know what that means until today. Yeah, okay, the feast, that's the best of the best, all right? And who is it for? It's for all peoples. It's for all nations. It's for all faces, all the earth. It's for all, okay? What's going to happen as he lays this feast? He is going to save people from something. He's going to swallow up the covering and the veil. What veil do you think of when you, when you see this in the Old Testament? What's the most pop, uh, not popular, common uh, or significant, significant veil in the Old Testament? Maybe the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple or the rest of humanity? And what's behind the Holy of Holies? The presence of God, life life, true life from non-life or life from death, he's going to swallow it up. There will be no more veil and life will spread everywhere. That's the picture I get there, yeah? He's going to swallow up death. He's going to wipe away tears. He's going to take away the reproach of people so that he might save them, rescue them, salvation, saving, right? And this is why they are so eagerly waiting for him. This is the picture that Isaiah 25 paints. And when Yahweh comes again, when the Messiah comes again, He is going to throw this big party for all peoples. Right? For all peoples. This is the sort of um, world that the Jews of Jesus' day grew up with. They were expecting somebody to come. And, and this is the kind of uh, image that Jesus is tapping into when he talks about a table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. It's going to be a feast for all peoples. But what kind of all peoples? Is it all peoples here or all peoples out there? And that's a question that we still ask today, right? Who is the kingdom of God for? Is it for people who are, you know, pretty similar to us? Or is it for all peoples out there as well? This, interestingly, is the kind of question that uh, the Jews of Jesus' day asked as well. Yeah? And unfortunately, by the time Jesus came around, Isaiah 25 started to be read as a passage referring to all peoples here for us only. Yeah, And so that's the kind of world that um, Jesus lived in. But the day was coming, Jesus says, where the doors to the banquet, we're actually in the room where, um, where I 
had a wedding banquet, uh, my, my friend's wedding banquet, and I, I, was, I was up here with my friend as well, performing and so on. The doors to the banquet would be thrown wide open, and many would stream in from east and west. The day was coming when the kingdom feast would no longer be filled with people who were all very similar. It was going to be opened up to a diverse people. And the day was today, according to Jesus. So what is Jesus' message here for us? You see, in this story, we see how Jesus brought the kingdom feast to someone who was very different from him. This gives us a vision into God's kingdom that he has designed. Like the stories of the banquet, the kingdom was always meant to be filled with diverse peoples. And if we trace this uh, characteristic of the kingdom backwards, we would find that it is something that pops up in many parts of the Old Testament, actually. You know, the Old Testament is not as closed to the Jews as we might think. Yeah? If you go back to somewhere like uh, the Tower of Babel, yeah, we would find that God was very angry with the people then. Yeah, why? Because of uh, arrogance and so on. But there's one important word in the story of Babel, which is one, O-N-E, one. Yeah? And that symbolizes how the people at Babel wanted to unify uh, the diverse peoples of God into one people. All right? Well, sound like National Day song. But yeah, one single people, one language, one objective, and so on. And that went against the diverse creation that God had in mind. And that's what happened, scattered, right, after that, yeah? And if you go back even further to the garden story, we see how the image of God was split into how many? Split into two, not one, yeah? The image of God was split into man and woman, two different people, not two same people, yeah? And so this, when, when we start to wrap our mind around this, we realize that the kingdom of God was always diverse and should always still be diverse, unified only by one king, but diverse peoples. So how does this inform uh, us, you know, when we talk about church today, when we talk about kingdom today? How does this shape our understanding of what PP, our church family here, should look like? From where I am here, I'm very glad to say that I already see a lot of diversity here, but I believe that there is yet a deeper calling yeah? In fact, I can, I can see two callings that we have from this passage. The first that I hear in this passage is a call to come to the table. You know, growing up here in PP, I always thought that this is what churches were like. Uh, I remember that um, when I was in my youth, actually even before, um, we used to hang out after service, chit-chat in lobby, um, and and we used to go out for lunches, and as a kid, and teenager, even an adult, I used to go over to each other's, uh, other people's homes as well. I thought this was common. But as I grew older and I traveled to other churches, visited elsewhere, I realized that uh, what we had was something very special, and um, actually not very common, yeah. This is who we are in PP. We are people of the table. We are people who love to eat together, of course, but also people who love to come together, to share life together as one family of Jesus. And this is something, unfortunately, that uh, I think over the last two plus years, with restrictions in the pandemic, it has kind of tempered that. I'm sure you feel it, yeah? But today, as things are lightening up, I believe that there is a call here for us because if we look back to how the last two years were, I think when um, we started to have more restrictions imposed on us, can't really eat together, can't really go out together, at one, can't really see each other's faces and so on, we tried to pivot a bit more to um, delivering good lessons online, yeah? live stream and so on. But I believe the church experience is so much more than information. It's got to be so much more than information dispensing. You know, like you take your sanitizer, bzz, come out a sermon, and then you learn a lot for that Sunday. It's got to be more than that, right? The early church experience was not marked by a series of lectures. It was not marked by a webinar where participants don't even interact with each other. The early church experience was marked by the breaking of bread, coming together, by sharing of life, Hey, they even shared their possessions with each other. And so if we, as a church, say we want to be like the early church, we got to live up to it. 
This is something that God is calling us to in this passage. And so it's been really encouraging over the last uh, few weeks. Actually, the last few weeks have been very busy for our church. Eh? Those of you who have been going for those walks and all that, almost, I think, three Sundays in a row, or four? I can't remember. Yeah, every week there's something. Oh, last week was the youth, youth one. Yeah, so uh, I think John is the one who has been on duty every week, every weekend. He's, he's, he's out there, yeah. And uh, it's, it's really great when we see that, um, you know, we're really connecting together more and more. And I pray that the Spirit of God will really light the fire in our hearts to desire to meet up more with each other. As they say, our greatest ability sometimes is our availability to each other. And there's so much truth in that. Because how can someone want to confide and share with you their struggle, maybe in their marriage or their friendship or in school, if they don't see you, right? So people need you. And I also want to add on by sharing um, or maybe uh, bringing up once again the story that, my, my own story. Do you remember what I shared one month ago? What really made me think a lot about how important I wanted God to be in my life, it was when we first came to PP as I was a ch when I was a child, five years old. And I started to think, wow, this church has a lot of uncles and aunties who come here on Sunday morning. This must mean something important to them. After that, I started realizing, hey, my friends are coming here on Sunday morning. In school, they talk about, oh, Sunday morning, there's Pokemon, you know, got to catch them all, watch the show. And here we are in Bible class at the, at the exact time, 9.30, you know. And uh, I was, it made me think, it did something to me back then, although I didn't know it. It made me realize that this body was something important. God was someone who was important and we are all here for each other. And so, if I have been to your home before, if I have come to your table before, just as I shared in the earlier story, um, I believe that you have done something to encourage me to be where I am today. And so as we come together and share meals together, share our lives together, I think that we need to realize the, that something special is happening in each of us. The Spirit is laying seeds and working in our hearts in a way that we may not see until uh, 30 years later. Actually, now when I came, I was five, right now I'm 34. Nearly 30 years later, you know, that this thing bore its fruit, all right? So you never know, uh, uncles and aunties, who you're inviting into your home, whether that person will one day say, I want to devote my life to this and that ministry, yeah? It may not be a full-time thing, it's totally fine, but you are sowing seeds of faith. You are doing something to the little boy or girl who's coming into your home. Yeah? The second um, message that I hear from this passage here is really to invite others who are not like you to come to the table. Jesus invited someone totally different from him, a Roman centurion, a man of war. You don't associate Jesus with that, do you? If the kingdom feast is a banquet open for all peoples, diverse peoples, it challenges me to ask myself how often I come to the table with someone who is different from me. You know, some time ago, uh, the ceiling fans in our home started slowing down dramatically. It was quite bad. I even went to test and I look at how fast it's spinning. And then I go to my sister's house and her minimum speed is like my maximum speed. It's very terrible. Don't buy... Um, Cresta brand. <laughs> Buy KDK. I bought the one uh, from the coffee shop. That one never slow down. One, okay? That's the best. KDK. Yeah. Also, also quite affordable. Yeah. So anyway, we got uh, an electrician in to change the fans. Okay? And uh, there were seven because we love ceiling fans. So seven in our home. And uh, yeah, it's a lot, right? And for those who are not so aware um, in, in you know, construction, renovation and all that, usually there is some sort of an invisible line uh, between homeowners and uh, the guys whom you, you uh, engage to come in to, to help you with your maintenance and so on. It's almost like some sort of unspoken expectation that they should be like invisible in a way, all right? Uh, we never really got that, still don't get it. So one day when the electrician came in, uh, his work, Passed across the lunchtime because there were so many fans. So, um, Sing Tian got uh, chicken rice and then um, we said, Hey, it's time for lunch. Okay. So he said, Yeah, okay. And then she laid our table for three of us. And um, when he saw that, he was quite shocked. He said, Uh, 这样吃啊? 
Then I said, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then he was like, uh, Zinda, really, uh, really. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, that man, uh, uh, are we going to eat like that? And uh, really, really, yeah. So he was very uncomfortable, actually. Uh, but <laughs> he kind of just insisted that he ate there with us because we wanted to chat with him. And uh, as we ate uh, and chatted, we began to know more about his story, how he grew up and so on. And today, um, thankfully, when we engaged him again, he said, uh, 你们算是朋友. Yeah, he, he regards us as his friends. We've also had quite a few uh, deep conversations about our life choices because he was very interested in why we choose to live the way that we do. So, so that was our experience, our close experience with someone who was, who's, comes from a very different background from us, look different, grew up different, speak different, everything different. And I'm sure you guys have your own experiences. In fact, I know for a fact that many of us here have a special heart for people who are not like us and, and you are very skilled at inviting them to the table. Just come and take a look. Yeah? And I want to uh, affirm that. And I want to say that our church family needs you to continue to invite people to the table as well. But remember one very important point from this story. It is not only about welcoming those who are beneath you to the table, all right? And I must say this very clearly because that may seem compassionate, but actually that's not the point of Jesus' ministry. If you look at what happened in the story, who was the Roman? He was many rungs above Jesus in the social ladder, right? But Jesus invited him. Who are the people whom Jesus will be whining and dining with? Tax collectors? Prostitutes? They were many rungs beneath Jesus in the social ladder. So what's this kingdom feast all about? The kingdom feast is not based on social ladders, power structures, or class distinctions. When we come to the Kingdom Feast, it is open to all, people like us and people not like us. So brothers and sisters, let us go forth in this week to, with the eyes to see the table that God is going to lay for us. This is the table where we hosted uh, our friend, the electrician, and um, Many other people also. It's a very special place in our hearts. And let us pray for the opportunities to share a meal, to share our life with people who are different from us. It may be at a physical table. It may be in your home. It may be in the office pantry. It may be at a coffee shop when people are in a you know, lunch crowd and they've choked their seat and then there's one more and then you say, hey, um, yeah, just come and sit here. Yeah? It may be elsewhere as well. It may be in a time of joy or a time of grief come to the table with others who are not like you figuratively share your life literally share a meal and let us pray for opportunities for the kingdom of god was always meant for all peoples so come peoples of the risen king come to the kingdom feast Invite others who are not like you because I believe that when you do so, like Jesus, you are going to be surprised and you are going to marvel at whom comes to the table. And many will start to stream in from east and west because of your invitation. Shall we stand and sing? <laughs>